let me start by saying what I do and where I live. I'm a deputy for my town's local sheriff's department. I live in a secluded little place in Northern California that lies right next to a river. Some of the houses here are even built practically on top of the damn thing. I'm not going to tell you the name of my town or even the river for fear of losing my job. What I will tell you though, the thing that I'm dying to tell you about is that there is something seriously wrong with this place. Now don't get me wrong. I love living here. In fact, this place has been a vacation spot for my family for as far back as my parents care to remember. We'd frequently come here to visit when I was a child and I have nothing but fond memories of this place. Being a deputy here doesn't quite carry the same excitement that comes with being a member of the San Francisco Police Department, but it definitely has its perks. It's beautiful, for one thing. Another plus is the people. They all have that sort of small town, friendly vibe going on, and being that I work for their sheriff's department and all, I get showered with love and respect from all angles. I do miss the excitement, though. Being a city cop is full of car chases and pandemonium that can really make you feel alive. But in the end, I had to leave that life behind for reasons which I won't be discussing right now. Anyways, I won't bore you with all of the details of my life. What I really want to talk about is the bridge. Now I know most of you won't believe me when I tell you that there's a bridge that appears and disappears at different points up and down the river. I didn't believe it at first either. Even after the bizarre shit that I've seen and heard, I still have trouble accepting any of it is real. That man, stuck in the middle of the sky, screaming in agony. God, it was awful. I never believed in ghosts or ghouls or any of that crap. But after living here for the past year, I just don't know what the hell I believe anymore. It's been eating me up inside something fierce. And for the purpose of my sanity, I can't keep this secret anymore. Even if... It means I risk losing my job. It's all in the reports. The reports that I've been spending all my downtime obsessing over. Every detail. Every last word. I practically have them all memorized by now. At least the ones that they would let me see. It all started with a conversation I overheard the other deputies having. They were in the break room of the station. And they were talking about some shit that happened a few years ago. As soon as I walked in. They all got real quiet then changed the subject. So I asked them what the deal was. They told me I wouldn't understand because I'm not from here. I told them to try me. I might be more understanding than they think. This was when I first arrived from the city. So I wasn't exactly one of the popular kids yet. I felt like an outsider. These men all grew up in this place and some of them even went to high school together. So I tried my best to be respectful. They finally agreed to tell me. But that I probably wouldn't believe in. They started talking about some of the cases they've had and calls they've had to respond to. Some of these incidents were with the town's residents and some involved out-of-towners. All of them revolved around this bridge that runs across the river. Only this isn't any normal bridge. It only appears to some people and never in the exact same spot twice. I thought they had to be fucking with me, but when I looked into their faces... I realized I was the only one laughing. Blake, who's now one of my best friends in the department, told me to come with him so he could show me something. I followed him, and he led me to our file room. He went to the back and opened up a filing cabinet that was in the corner. The cabinet looked different than the others, and it had a symbol on the side that I'd never seen or noticed before. Blake pulled out a binder, then locked the cabinet back up immediately. He dropped it down on a nearby desk, and it landed with a thud. Then he told me to have fun as he walked out of the room. I picked up the binder right away and went back to my desk. My curiosity was piqued now. These were actual professional reports. Now, they may or may not have been officially on the record, but there's no way they were faked. The incidents written down on them had to be real, at least from an investigative standpoint. I looked at the title of the binder. It read, the Phantom Bridge Reports, in large, italicized font. I started flipping through the contents. After reading a few of them, I felt like I was in some kind of bizarre dream. These reports were the stuff of nightmares. I can't adequately describe how utterly surreal these occurrences were. It's best if I just share them with you, which is what I'm going to do now. 
I'm going to do my best to transcribe exactly what was in the reports and what I gathered from the deputies who were assigned to the cases and calls without any embellishments. Here we go. Seven-year-old boy goes missing. The first report I read about was the seven-year-old son of a family who had just moved here about a month prior to his disappearance. I don't know too many details about this one because the deputy assigned to the case, Kyle, wasn't willing to speak much about it. He just gave me a few extra details other than what was in the report. The river was low around this time and there were parts where the rocks and dirt at the bottom were almost fully exposed. The boy was having trouble adjusting to his new home and surroundings, so he often liked to run off and play in the creek bed which was a couple hundred yards behind the family's property. One day, he was playing down by the river with his toys when he spotted a bridge off to his right. When questioned by Kyle later, he would tell him that it spanned a distance of about 50 feet across the river from the cliffs overlooking the water. He would later tell his parents that the bridge looked old and dirty. Due to the bridge seemingly appearing out of thin air, the boy became frightened and ran back home to tell his parents about what he had seen. He was known to possess an overactive imagination and often pretended to be off in some make-believe world. Therefore, the parents dismissed the boy's story as part of some game he was playing. A few days later, the boy returned to the same spot of the creek, which he was playing before and again noticed the bridge. This time, rather than becoming frightened, he became intrigued and began to venture towards it. When the boy got close to the underside of it, he spotted what appeared to be a man by some bushes growing on the sides of the bank. The man approached the boy and told him that he was from somewhere called the Gray Place. He offered to take the boy there, promising to relieve him of his sad life here. The boy would later recall that he couldn't see the man's face because he seemingly only walked backwards towards him. He was dressed in baggy, hooded garb, which covered his whole body. The boy fled back to his house and told his mother about the encounter. She immediately called the sheriffs and filed a report about a strange man who had tried to abduct her son. She also banned her son from playing by the river after the deputy came by and questioned the boy. About a month after the previous events, the boy had gotten into an argument with his mother. She locked him in his room, but he snuck out of the window and ran down to the creek bed. He was spotted by a man driving on the road near that part of the river. He never returned home after this. The mother immediately filed a missing persons report for her son, and posters were put up all over town, including pictures of the boy. He was never found. Although, 31 days after the missing persons report was filed, he was reported by a town local to be walking along the river a few miles from the family's home, holding the hand of a man wearing hooded clothes. After spotting the boy, the locals gave chase but lost sight of them after turning a corner on the riverbank. That was the final sighting. Newlyweds Encounter Bridge The next report involved a couple from out of town who were just driving through. They had gotten married in San Diego and were taking a road trip through California, according to Sammy, the deputy who questioned them afterwards. They were driving down one of the roads that runs parallel with the river, trying to find a way back to the highway. A couple miles down, they reached a secluded spot and discovered that a large bridge was constructed over a portion of the river. If they were to cross it, it would mean they would have to drive all the way around to get to where they were going, and the bridge would act as a shortcut. Even though it looked like it was placed in kind of a strange spot, the couple decided to cross it to the other side, where another road, closer to the highway, was waiting for them. They described the bridge as appearing strong and sturdy. They said it had a large truss, and it looked like it had just been built recently. It spanned a length of about 100 feet, and had a raised deck which connected the two sides of the river. They recalled it was bright red color with a thick glossiness to it, and that it shined bright when the sun hit it. The man said it was completely overkill for the purpose of crossing a small patch of water. The couple drove over it with no problems, and took their time to gawk at its engineering beauty. The woman took a couple pictures of the truss jutting up on both their sides, using her phone's camera, as they slowly rolled over the platform. They both suspected it might be some kind of tourist attraction, constructed to give outsiders, as well as the locals, something to marvel at when they passed through, and being that it was placed right where they needed a bridge, at the exact time they needed it, they weren't complaining. When they reached the other side, however, 
they noticed something was horribly wrong. The bridge had put them in the exact same spot they had started from. They were now back on the other side of the river from where they were supposed to be. They were staring out the windshield at the river. From one point right before their car had started up, the raised platform in the first place. Only now the bridge was gone. The man slammed on the car's brakes before almost driving his Honda Accord directly into the water. After the car came to a stop, the couple both stared at each other, completely baffled and questioning their own sanity. They both had the same account of what had happened though, so they figured it had to be real. They decided to make a stop by the sheriff's department. Sammy was there to fill out the report. She said they both had a look of confused fear on their faces and seemed dazed while they drank their cups of coffee, given to them as a courtesy by the employees working at the station. She suggested they look on the woman's phone at the picture she took. When they did, they found the photos had been replaced by some strange pictures of trees. Trees that appeared to be deep within some forest. After this, they both became really spooked and just wanted to get out of town. So, they got in their car and headed for the highway immediately. Now, the really strange thing about this is that the woman actually called the station a month later and asked to speak with Sammy. She told Sammy that she had been having some weird dreams about being trapped in some ancient forest. They were nightmares, really. The worst kind. And she would wake up screaming and scaring the living hell out of her new husband. She said that in the dreams, there were these trees that seemed to pulse like they were alive. And they would tell her horrible things that she didn't want to know. Things about the people she knew, and relatives, and close friends, and distant family members. Sammy couldn't do anything for her, really. All she could do was tell her to maybe consult with a psychiatrist or seek out some kind of therapy. The woman got offended at this suggestion and hung up angrily. She hasn't called the station since. Jogger out for a stroll. Another report contained within those first few that I looked at involved a jogger who was out for a stroll one morning. The man was a local in his 30s and lived in a neighborhood about a mile from the river before he moved. He would go for these jogs most mornings before work. He always set out just before dawn and would time his runs so he could catch the sunrise as soon as he reached the river. He would rest on the banks and enjoy a protein bar while watching a beautiful sunrise make its way over the mountains. He told this information to Blake. Well, he was in a complete state of panic. Apparently, Blake knew this man personally. He was an old buddy of his. The morning of the incident, the man set out on his usual jog. He left well, it was still dark out, and managed to make it to the river just in time for the sun to come creeping up. As he was sitting on the riverbank, eating his breakfast, he noticed something down a little further from where he was. It was a bridge, half hidden behind some trees. Now, the man had taken this route every morning, like clockwork, and had never seen a bridge that crossed the river on any of his runs. But... Being a local of this town since childhood, he had heard legends about a bridge that sometimes appeared to certain people. He never believed any of it though. And even now as he stared at this odd structure that seemed to have appeared out of thin air, he still thought that maybe someone was playing a trick on him or something. So, he went to investigate. When he reached it, he could see that it was a covered bridge, meaning it had a roof and some walls covering most of its walkway. He said it looked old, rickety, and dilapidated, and that it seemed like it could fall into the river any minute. Half the wood was unpainted and splintered, and the covered part leaned a little bit off center. It was right in between a large group of trees which wrapped their branches around it, like bony fingers coming up from the dirt. It connected two opposing cliffs on the river banks that spanned about 40 feet. It was high above the water, with a good 30 foot drop in store for anything that fell off. The man immediately noticed how dark it was inside the covered structure. There was light coming in from the other side, but in the middle, it was like all the light had been stripped away. He thought that if somebody had gone through all this trouble just to fuck with him, by constructing a goddamn bridge practically overnight, he might as well see it through. So he ventured inside. About 10 feet in, things started to get weird. The man told Blake. He said that suddenly, there was a different atmosphere. It was nice and breezy from the cool morning air one second, and then it was like a dry heat sauna. There was also this putrid smell coming in from all directions. 
which he likened to a pit full of rotting, dead animals. It was suffocating, and his breaths were becoming strained, but his curiosity pushed him forwards. After about another ten feet, he began to hear strange noises. He was in the part of the bridge where it was darkest now, and he could barely see two feet in front of him. He was carefully watching his step when he heard a loud bang on the wall next to him, and then another. He jumped and backed up a couple feet startled. Then the banging got louder and more frequent. A hailstorm of bangs and thuds and scrapes were racking his ears and brain. It was like a hundred people were banging on the walls of the confinement all at once. He said he could almost see their handprints leaving marks on the walls next to him. Then he started to hear people screaming in agony and pleading for him to help. Some were speaking in English and some were speaking in languages that he didn't recognize. But their voices were plagued with absolute desperation and madness. Confused and terrified, he turned around and started quickly walking back in the direction he came. As he turned though, he caught something out of the corner of his eye. Down towards the end of the opposite side of the tunnel was a figure. It was massive. It stood at least 10 feet tall and appeared to be made from pure darkness. He said that it was at this moment when he realized why it was so dark in there. It was because of this thing. It was like the antithesis of light, standing there, sucking up all fragments of color like a demented vacuum. Then he said a face appeared on the creature, a face that was staring at him. It had two bulbous, white eyes, and a smile that spanned nearly his whole head. The smile was one of utter malice. It was invading his mind, consuming him. The dread at that moment was like nothing he had ever felt in his entire life. If he would have stared any longer, he said he would have gone insane. He didn't wait anymore. In a state of absolute terror, he spun around so fast that his vision got blurry. He didn't stop running until he made it all the way home. When he got back to his house, he woke up his wife and told her everything that had happened. She said he was frightening her. So he went outside and called the sheriff's station. He asked for Blake personally. He told him everything. And Blake told him to relax that he would drive out to his house so they could talk. He wanted to calm this poor guy down. Blake did just that when he got there and managed to at least get him to stop violently shaking. They talked some more and enjoyed a cup of coffee. Blake said he would stop by again later to check up on him. Before leaving though, the man had one last thing to add. He said that if he knew he had walked another couple feet down that bridge, he wouldn't have made it back out. The half-bridge attempted suicide. The last report I read that day, within the initial binder, was a case involving another local. Instead of being happily married, however, like the last man, this guy was recently divorced. He had grown up here as well and had heard all the local legends surrounding the Phantom Bridge. But instead of brushing them off as mere campfire stories like the other guy, he truly believed them. This information was collected by Deputy Sheriff Kyle, who was much more vocal on this case with me than he had been on the one about the missing boy. Now, this man was actually a little obsessive about the bridge, and on numerous occasions, he had gone out hunting for it. He had hoped to catch a glimpse of this perplexing anomaly that only appeared to a select few. This guy had some issues, is how Kyle described him. He knew all this because the man had treated Kyle as if he was the guy's personal therapist, spilling a whole bunch of personal information to him when he arrived on the scene that day. Given the circumstances though, Kyle was glad the guy was chatting and filled with an odd sense of elation rather than an overwhelming despair, which very well could have been the case. Apparently, the man's wife had enough of him. She divorced him and took custody of the kids as well as the house. It's a real sad story actually. The guy just couldn't catch a break. So, one day, he gets really drunk and lonely and decides to take a hike to see if he can clear his head. He rode out to one of the mountain's trails a little ways out of town, which puts you up at the top of this giant cliff that overlooks a raging part of the river below. It's a beautiful sight when you reach the top. You can see the river snake the hills for miles. The water is surrounded by beautiful trees and wildlife. There was just one problem that day. This time, when the man got to the top of the cliff, he didn't find the same view he had always seen before. This time, there was a half-bridge jutting out from the top of the cliff and abruptly ending in midair. The man knew what it was right away, and he couldn't believe it. 
All those times he had gone out hunting for the damn thing and hadn't caught so much as a glimpse. And now, it was right here in front of him, when he hadn't been searching for it in the least. He later told Kyle that it was a small bridge, maybe three feet wide and only about seven or eight feet long. Before being completely cut off, the last board was about half the size of the ones leading up to it. Like someone had taken a giant saw and hacked it right down the middle. It was plain, but impossibly sturdy. He said with a structural standpoint, it made no sense. It was just jutting out from the cliff with nothing substantial to hold it up. Yet there it was, sturdy as a concrete plank, fixed to a building and completely straight. He also said there were these ropes coming up from the sides that acted as rails which you could place your hands on. They were woven into a sturdy design and came out about as high as his stomach. As soon as the man saw it, he knew something was wrong. It didn't bring out a sense of adventure like he had always hoped. Nothing could have prepared him for the reality that he discovered that day. The reality that began to crawl inside him and seep into his consciousness. It was manifesting something deep within him, something sinister and frightening. Then it began to talk to him. It told him he's a loser, that he's always been a loser. It told him his wife hates him, his kids hate him, and everything he'd ever done hadn't amounted to shit because he lacked any talent or ambition. It told him his whole life was just one bad joke after another and that his only option was to put an end to it. Right now, for good. The man began to cry. He began to sob uncontrollably. He dropped to his knees because he knew it was all true. He was a loser, he thought. His kids hate his guts, and he can't even hold down a steady job because he's lazy, talentless, and a worthless alcoholic. That's why his marriage ended, he thought. Because his wife knew what he was, and that he was incapable of changing. He began to hate himself in ways he never thought possible. In that moment... He knew there was no place for him in this world anymore. After he let this sink in for a few minutes, he knew what he had to do. He got up without hesitation and went over to the bridge. Then he began to walk it like a plank. Now, sometime when he was on his knees sobbing, a woman, another hiker who was making her way up to the overlook, had seen him bawling and looking very unstable. By the time he got himself to his first board of the bridge, she didn't have time to even consider the structure's odd perplexities because she had realized what the man aimed to do. She dropped her backpack and broke into a sprint to try and reach him before he got to the end. He made it about halfway when she began to scream at him. She was yelling at him to stop and turn around. She tried everything to get his attention, but none of it was working. Then, in a truly heroic fashion, she ran down the bridge and caught him just as he had reached the last board and was on his way over. She grabbed him by the arm, and he turned to look at her, which snapped him out of his trance. After a brief struggle, they both fell back onto the dirt at the edge of the cliff. By the time they got up and composed themselves, the bridge had vanished, and there was nothing left but a view of the river and trees below. After it was all over, the woman called 911 from her cell phone, and they sent Kyle out to the scene while the woman waited with the man patiently. When the deputy got there, the guy was full of this bizarre energy. The look on his face was one of elation, for he had just escaped death by a fraction of an inch, and he knew it. Kyle expected to see a depressed, mess of a man waiting there for him, but instead, the guy was full of good cheer and wouldn't shut up. He willingly went with Kyle, who took him to the hospital to be evaluated. The man entered therapy after being released, and that was the last anybody at the station ever heard about him. As for the woman who had saved the guy, well, she ended up joining the force about a half a year later. She came into the sheriff's station that day after the incident, inquiring about a full-time position as a deputy. They were all impressed with her display of courage and physical strength, so they set her on the right track. Her name is Sammy. The man stuck in the sky. Unfortunately, not all encounters with a bridge end with someone finding a new outlook on life. As you've gathered by now, from the previous reports. Sometimes, however, they're downright devastating for everybody involved. I know this firsthand, you see. For there was a time when I personally witnessed the absolute fucking evil that hides in the shadows on that river. Sometimes, bodies would turn up under mysterious circumstances. 
and me and the other deputies would be called out to go investigate. One time, some kids found the body of a dead man caught in some driftwood about a mile out of town in a secluded little spot on the water. Me and Blake were sent to check it out. Once we got down there and saw it, I was thankful I hadn't eaten breakfast that day because I probably would have lost it. The body was bloated and pale from being trapped in the water for who knows how long. The autopsy revealed he'd been dead for weeks, but they had trouble placing how long he'd been in the river for. What really irked me, though, was that the body was full of these strange holes. Everywhere. On his arms, his legs, his torso, even his head, and the bottoms of his feet. It looked like someone took a giant drill and just went to town. Fragments of skin were dangling off the newly made orifices, which looked even more grotesque floating in the water. It was god-awful, and we all knew what was responsible. The man's identity was never uncovered. Yeah, I saw some real sick shit turn up in that river, but nothing was more disturbing than the man stuck in the sky. It was about eight months after I had first moved out here, when we got a call from some woman who was on horseback and had been riding on one of the roads that lies next to the river. She was hysterical and requested we come out to her right away. When we got there, we found her sitting down on one of the banks. She had tied her horse up to a nearby tree, and the beast was spooked to all hell, bucking and neighing like the devil had gotten into him. From the first moment I saw her, she had been staring up into the sky, transfixed on something that none of us could see. When we climbed down and reached her, she barely acknowledged our presence before asking us if we could hear it. At first, we thought she might just be a little kooky, or possibly on drugs. Then after a bit, we heard a man begin to speak. His voice was coming from the spot where she was staring. He said he was trapped. He said he came to this town to visit his dying grandma, and after she'd passed, he went on his way back home. When driving out of town, he'd seen a bridge that crossed the river. He said he didn't know where it would take him, and that it looked like it just led to a dirt patch with some trees on the other side. He was feeling curious, and he decided to cross it in his Toyota Tacoma. When he got about halfway, everything went dark, and his truck died. He was still sitting in the driver's seat, and he couldn't see anything except for the light on his cell phone, which had no reception. He'd been there for at least a couple hours now, too scared to get out, so he started screaming his lungs out, hoping someone would hear him. Eventually, his screams were heard by the woman on the horse, who called us out there because neither of them knew what else to do. He said he was freezing where he was, and the truck wouldn't turn on to allow him to use the heater. He sounded young, maybe in his early 20s or maybe even his teens. We all looked at each other, me, Blake, and Sammy. We were stunned. Obviously, we had no way of reaching him, so we told the kid to use the light on his phone to see what was around him. We thought maybe there was an exit nearby. We told him to get out of the truck and look around, but to walk very slowly and be mindful of his surroundings. He was scared and his voice was shaking, but he did what we told him to do. He said he stayed within a 30-foot radius of his truck and only saw more darkness. He said the ground was stable, but there appeared to be no walls or ceilings of any kind. It was just blackness that stretched on for what seemed like eternity. Then he said he saw a small light from off in the distance. He got excited at this and began to scream at whatever was approaching, pleading for help. This went on for a couple minutes. He said whatever it was, it was getting bigger by the second and it remained steadily approaching. He began to hear something like footsteps coming from it. The echo reached his ears like loud thunderclaps in the darkness and the light pulsed with each booming crash. It was about this time he got a burst of adrenaline and started running towards it. And then, everything changed. Suddenly, he began sprinting back to the truck nervously. We heard him running in the empty air, always at the same spot in the sky, no matter how far he'd gone. He got back in the truck and slammed the door behind him. We heard him start to speak again, only now, there was a terror in his voice that hadn't been present before. He said things like, Oh God. And, I don't want to die here. I don't want to die here. He repeated these phrases through heavy breathing. He called out to us for help, but there was nothing we could do. As useless as cattle watching an approaching train wreck, we just stood there 
and stared at the sky. I had already called the fire department who were on their way with a big ladder that might be able to reach him, but even if we could get to the spot he was at, I knew it would be no use. It's not like we could just reach up and grab him and pull him out of thin air. Eventually he stopped screaming and just sat there helplessly. His cries grew more and more heartbreaking as we all reached to a state of complete despair. We heard him say the thing was close now. He could see something like a face. It was radiating blinding tentacles of light that burned his eyes. He said it was like staring into a thousand suns exploding at once. He screamed at it to go away as we heard banging sounds on metal. We heard the door to the truck open again. Shortly after, the kid let out the most agonizing scream I've ever heard. He was crying and shouting, it burns, it burns. The last thing we heard was the kid scream for his grandma. Then his voice was cut off abruptly and replaced with silence. I lost a little piece of myself that day. I think we all did. Me, Sammy, Blake, and the woman with the horse. Not being able to help that poor kid took a heavy toll on me. You don't realize how much you take for granted until everything you know is flipped inside out and you realize that sometimes things aren't going to be okay. I don't think I'll ever fully recover from that. The Hitchhiker The last story I'm going to tell you for now is one that you won't find in any police report or documented in any file. Back in the late 1960s, there was a young man who had just pulled out of a residential neighborhood in his Buick to go for a beer run. He was now driving on a quiet road that ran parallel with a nearby river. He was a little buzzed from the half joint he smoked, and his friends were back at the house, waiting for him to return with a case of beer. He was in a social mood, but unfortunately, he had no one on this drive to be social with, so he felt excited when he saw another long-haired young man, much like himself, sticking his thumb out while walking backwards along the road, except as he approached and the hitchhiker got closer, he could see that something was wrong. The man was shirtless, hunched over, and holding his stomach with his other hand. The one that he wasn't sticking out to give the universal hitchhiking gesture. He could also see the man's walk was strained, and he had a slight limp as if it pained him to stand upright. Without hesitation, the driver pulled up next to him and put his foot on the brake. He saw that the reason he was shirtless was because he was bleeding profusely out of the side of his stomach, and he had wrapped his shirt around it tightly in an attempt to stop the bleeding. The injured man immediately hobbled over to the rear door and let himself into the back seat. He explained to the driver that he had been camping out on the river, and about 20 minutes ago, he had a run-in with some strange animal. This animal was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It had horns and was about the size of a deer but had the ability to stand upright on two legs. In his attempt to get away from it, he had slipped and fallen down an embankment, landing badly on a sharp rock. He said that he desperately needed medical attention and asked kindly if the driver could take him to the nearest hospital. The driver didn't really believe that he had seen such a creature, as he had described the thought that maybe the man was on hallucinogenic drugs. But he was obviously very hurt, and he was willing to put the party on hold to help this stranger who was in a bad spot. The injured man said that in order to get to the hospital, they would have to cross the river and get on the highway. He said that there was a bridge coming up after this next left that would allow them to take a much quicker route than going all the way around. The driver thought he might have misheard the man, for he had been traveling up and down this road for the past few days, frequently, and he had never seen a bridge that crossed the water. He figured the man was just woozy from his injury, or once again, on drugs, and that he would realize his error after the upcoming turn. But, sure enough, after the bend he saw a bridge that crossed the river a ways down. This perplexed the driver, and he began to feel that something wasn't right here. As they got closer to it, he could see that it looked old and worn, like it hadn't been used for ages. It even had some green moss covering its big, steel truss. And that frame that was close to the water was caked in an orange rust. That's just not possible, he thought. Yet here it was. The man in the back seat became anxious and urged him to take the bridge. He reminded him profusely not to miss it, stating that his wound was getting worse and taking the long way could be bad for him. Upon reaching the turn that led to its deck, the driver slowed the car to a crawl, 
and hesitated. He then explained his predicament, divulging that it wasn't there the past few days and that it didn't look right. The injured man laughed and assured him there's nothing to worry about. He chalked up the fact that he had no memory of it to the driver being unobservant. The driver thought this possible, but he couldn't deny that the closer they got, the more uneasy he was feeling. Ultimately, he drove past him, which sparked a serious reaction from the man in the back seat. His urgent but friendly demeanor dropped, and he sounded angry now. He told the driver he was being inconsiderate, and that he was in pain and needed attention now. The driver explained it wouldn't take much longer to head down to Red Rock Avenue and cut across to the highway there. What was before? A mixed expression of gratitude and pain cringes on the hitchhiker's face suddenly became something sinister. He narrowed his eyebrows and glared at the driver through the rear view. Then he leaned forward, close to the driver's ear, and began to insult him. He called him a sissy and mocked him for being scared of the bridge. Then he raised his voice and demanded that he turn back around. The driver was becoming increasingly more frightened as this man became more unpredictable. The hitchhiker was berating him now, calling him stupid and blind for not noticing the bridge before. The driver considered pulling over and forcing the man out of his car, sensing that he might be in danger. The man continued his verbal assault and started banging on the headrest of the driver's seat enraged. The driver was just about to stop the car, when all at once, the man stopped with the hysterics and leaned back in his seat calmly. A sudden air of collectiveness washed over him. Then he said something that chilled the driver to his very core. What he said was, The veil that separates us withers with each soul devoured. All that crawls behind the curtain will soon cross over, and there is nothing your gods can do to save you. Just then, something dashed across the road and the driver slammed on his brakes. It looked like a large, deformed animal with horns that protruded from different parts of its head. Only it ran on two legs before getting down on all four again, and disappearing into the brush. It was fast, but its walk seemed stunted somehow. Its legs were a mess of odd contorted angles that swayed grotesquely with each step. It had a face like a person, but it was covered in hair. For just one second, it turned its gaze upon the driver, and he felt a chill that overpowered his whole body. He was temporarily stuck. He couldn't even move his hands from the wheel. He could only stare until the creature disappeared into the bushes and was gone. Once he regained movement, he turned his head to look in the back seat. The man was gone, just as the creature was. The driver tried to forget that day, tried to drown it out with whiskey and other substances in the beginning, but the memory never dulled. It was always as sharp as the moment it happened, and he could recall it with a fierce intensity that he sometimes shared with others. The first time he told me, I was about 13 years old and we were making s'mores around a bonfire in the backyard. He asked me if I wanted to hear a ghost story. After he was done, I asked him where he'd heard that one before. When he said that it actually happened to him, I laughed and told him he was full of shit, but the look on his face said otherwise. I've never seen the same look on my father's face since, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. I'm not sure I'll ever forget these words either, the ones the hitchhiker told him before he vanished. All that crawls behind the curtain will soon cross over, and there is nothing your gods can do to save you. Yeah, I've been thinking about those words a lot as of late. I never put too much stake in his story. Half of me used to think he was just using it to get a rise out of us whenever he would tell some new friend of mine to gather around for a ghost story during our camping trips. They would always be scared shitless after that, paranoid of every bump and scrape they heard in the woods. So, I guess my dad did enjoy the excitement of scaring others just for the hell of it. Now, I realize he liked having a good spooky little story to tell and pretending it didn't bother him anymore, when in reality, he just needed to get it out. With each retelling, it was like therapy for him in a way. But those words, every time he would say those words, they always haunted me. I've memorized them, the same as he has. Ever since I was a kid, and now they've taken on a whole new meaning to me. Like I said, my family has history in this little town, and now, so do I. <laughs>